Hey Dude, The 90s Call, with Christine Taylor and David Lasher. Hey everybody, welcome back to Hey Dude, The 90s Called podcast. I am David. Hi David, I'm David's co-host, Christine. Uh, co-host, <laughs> old, one of my oldest, dearest friends. I know, I was just thinking about that. I was really just thinking about, and because also I got a text from our, our, our mutual friend, Jonathan Galkin, um, who is going to be in New York. I mean, he he's a New Yorker, but he's going to be around and he was trying to get together. And and I just was thinking like, how cool. I know we've talked about it a million times, but I just keep thinking that, that we just never thought that we would all be here reunited, talking, you know, sort of all of the memories that we have. I don't know. It's just, it's just our lives all went in different directions. And now it's just so cool at this stage in our lives to sort of come back and, and just have such a love of talking about our time together, you know, and yeah, I don't know. A, I just a little was bit feeling... of time. Yeah. It makes you appreciate the, the relationships you had and the experiences you, you shared with that we shared together. Yes. It's like the be- it was the best of times. And uh, yeah. This- yes, it was. It was. And like, and I think we've said it before, too, that it's helpful to have friends who were with you at that period in your life to right. sort of fill in the picture. Right. Because right. we're only experiencing experiencing it through our lens. So whether it was a the, like the happiest moment or a, or a, you know, depressing moment. And it just is so nice to sort of get the full picture <laughs> from people right. who are like, no, <laughs> are you kidding? You loved that. <laughs> and I didn't remember how much I loved it or how much right. fun we had. Are you telling me that I don't remember anything? <laughs> yeah, I think Which, you're piecing it all back together. I think I'm we're actually, yeah. I think the puzzle pieces are coming together and we are all very... We, I think we just sort of collectively feel very grateful for that experience. I'll tell you this. The, the, the company that promotes this, this uh, event called 90s Con. Yes. In Hartford, Connecticut, which I've always, you, know, you and I are always on the outside looking in like, oh, my God, everybody's there. <laughs> right. Well, they want to do a Hey Dude reunion. They do? Yeah. They want us all to be there. And so next I, year. It's in March. Yeah. It's not till March, but uh, it's a big event and people love it. Oh, that's great. That would be so much fun to do. Yeah. Because our reunion, which, you know, we've all reunited in different ways, but that reunion reunion we did in Austin, Kelly wasn't there. And so it would be so great to get as many of us Oh, Kelly's in. Yeah. I I already sent it to Kelly and to Josh and and I, I... texted Lisa Malamed for David Brisbane's email so they can reach out to him. <laughs> okay, they said great. they've already reached out to you, but whatever. In March in Hartford, 90s Con, that would be another great chance for all of us to get together. Yes. I want to, I, I mean, that would be, I, that would that would be so perfect. And it would be a perfect way for us too, because then we'll, we will have been doing this podcast for a little over a year at that point. And, you know, I don't know. I think it'll just be it just It'll makes be, sense. It's it good timing. Make sense. Good timing. We, we like if they asked us two years ago, we would have been like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> but now we're like, yes. <laughs> I know. I was yes, exactly. We're probably we did that reunion. Like what 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 more can but now right. I feel like so many we've talked about so many things on this podcast and shared so many stories that we didn't share at that reunion in Austin. Right. So yep. it's now a whole new, it's a whole new, it would be a whole new panel, a whole new level of, <laughs> of, uh, hey dude, gossip and dirt. And it's literally right in our wheels. I mean, in our wheelhouse for our audience, right? A nineties convention. Yes. I mean, that's, that's us. Yes. Uh, I'm in. Our guest is in the waiting room, right? Yes, he is. Listen, this guy is one of the funniest people I've ever met. And I don't even know if he'll remember when we first worked together because it was so long ago, but let's see if he remembers. But, oh, great. I, I'm a big fan and I, uh, he always steals the show and everything he's been in. So let's bring in our guest, Jamie Kennedy. How are you guys? All it's right. so good to see you. Yeah, man. Ah, oh, so good to see you too. Dude, do you remember where we first met? Because I was just asking Christine. Of course. I could tell you the whole story. Tell me everything. Uh, So 
I was dating a very uh, lovely woman by the name of Jenica Berger, and Jenica got me an audition uh, on a pilot and gave it. And a young man by the name of Kevin Conley and were the stars, along with another woman by the name of Denise Richards. Right. And <laughs> I was, my character was a reoccurring if it happened, and he was stony. He was stony because he was. <laughs> the show was called How High. I mean, it was, yes. it was spelled H O W E. Right. But yes. it was about a high school of stoners. Yeah. Yes. And Jamie, Jamie was the lead stoner. <laughs> I was. The lead of the pack of stoners over here. David was the other. He was the more together stoner. But, I was um, like the Ferris Bueller of the show. That show, I thought, was going to be a massive hit. It was wild because that was like the beginning of youth programming. I always tell people, like, growing up, I had Matlock, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Great ch- and, children's programming. Yeah, and then, and then we we... That was like a younger skewing show. From that, I owe you because I got a couple of those episodes of that show. Right. And it was Bobcat Goldthwait doing the voice of the puppet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, dude, I, it's so good to see you, man. I've been I, I've been cheering you on and watching everything you're doing for so many years. And I was always like, that's a guy ro- walking through the hallway with the red stoned <laughs> eyes. And he's crushing it. Thank you, bro. I'm a fan too, dude. We, I, I was like my first, 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 first. Like it was wild to do right. that. I was, Ron Levitt is the sweetest man. He really yeah. encouraging. I really owe Jessica Hahn as well. She like really encouraged me. Um, she like she was just always so nice to me, you know. And so it's like just to break in like that was incredible. Yeah, those memories of that person that gave you. A break when you were busting your butt and out in, uh, you know, not even getting callbacks and that, you know, that you, we all remember that first person who just believed in you, who had faith, Mm -hmm. who loved you. And I I still to this day, those casting directors are the ones that I just have the softest spot. So what was your, tell us about Jamie's upbringing. So you're a Pennsylvania boy. Mm -hmm. I'm a pencil. I'm a PA girl. Where? Right outside of Allentown. We're living here in <laughs> Allentown. Wow. You're legit. You I'm really legit. are. <laughs> wow. Are you, That's a, a real are you a Amish? No, <laughs> not Amish. I mean, we were in like middle America, suburbia outside. I went to high school in Center City, Allentown, which was at the time, you know, a little rough around the edges. There was a, a prison there and but we you know i did 12 years of catholic school back there and uh <laughs> yeah <Similar>. yep. <laughs> wow the uniforms all of it yeah um i grew up on a place called upper darby yeah and um it's from uh out right outside of philadelphia yep and right on the edge of a place called uh 69th street so it was like upper darby was one side and then 69th street was in the middle place called the tower theater and then the other side was philly and so i was like on the side that went more into the suburbs and you know then you go to a place called villanova Mm -hmm. and then till later on i didn't realize all the actors that were from there so tina fey i guess went to the neighboring high school she's from upper darby but i never knew her sherry o'terry i think is from there oh funny people Funny, Funny people, people in Pennsylvania. Who knew? <laughs> it's, Who knew? it's wild. Um, uh, Kevin Bacon's from Villanova. And then they're on, on the other side to the little right or left, there's a place called Overbrook where Will Chamberlain's from. Uh, and then I believe Ryan Phillippe's from there. And I believe Seth Green is, was spent some time there. So there's a lot of different people from that area. And obviously Will Smith is from West Philly. So it was all right. that area. Yeah. So you tell us about just, you know, Catholic school, seemingly traditional upbringing. My parents started off poor. And as they got kids, they believe it or not, they started doing better in life and started making a little bit more money with each kid. So by the time I got to me, I was I was kind of not I was there's a big gap between my older siblings and me. So I was kind of having my own little thing. And I was the first kid like to have an Atari. And I wasn't spoiled, but I was definitely comfortable. And um, oh, just getting that first cat. Atari, that was yeah. the, that was a status symbol. I remember that. <laughs> right, it was the wild Pac-Man. thinking about 
Yeah, so it's like it was, um, you know, I just went to Catholic school in 12 years, and then I felt very much like, you know, I got to escape. Yeah. I think probably Catholic schools made more people go to Hollywood than held them back from Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I'm not doing life this way anymore. I'm going to do something completely different. Yes. My experience there was, it was very strict, but we had some, I remember I had some cool teachers. There were really great things, but I, the, what I found was the theater. Like I found, you know, the, the show kids and I did, you know, community theater in Allentown and it was all always just the school plays that, um, you know, was my escape. Was that similar for you or were you just making your way through I found nothing like that. Mine really? Was, yeah, mine, <laughs> mine was the complete opposite. I found the streets. No. The hardcore streets. Uh, yeah, pretty much. The bad I boy. Found the play- Not bad boy, but I just found the playground. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. We used to go to the playground. That's where I learned about rap music. That's where I learned about break dancing. That's where I learned about, you know, the culture, like cool culture, you know? So I was yeah. always just hanging around the basketball courts and doing that. And it was... And then, like I said, but I had the ability, I always tell people to experience the coolness of the streets because our area was right where everyone mixed. And then I always had the safety of going back to the suburb. So, uh, yeah, I was never a theater kid. I didn't do comedy. I was always with the kids that was just like riding bikes and listening to rap music. And not, I wasn't in the drugs or anything, but I was, I loved, I loved basketball and I loved, um, and I love some baseball, but it basically I was, you know, having fun, but I was always, I, I didn't know anything about that life. Hollywood was like Mars to me, you know, and, but I love movies. I used to ton, watch a ton of movies. My friend had cable. It was like one of the first kids in the neighborhood cable. So we used to watch John Hughes. I always tell Anthony Michael Hall, he raised me whether he knows it or not. Right. And, oh yeah. yeah all yeah, of us, right? All, all John, yeah. John, John, John Hughes, Hughes basically raised all of us. All of us. They raised us. Like I, I tell them that. I, I, like you, you have completely formed who I am. You know, I tell Judd Nelson that. You know, so bottom line is, uh, yeah. Once I, I just people, you know, in the in the neighborhood, if you did, it was either you were funny or. There were some tough kids or you're a fighter. I was never a fighter. So I kind of used my humor to get out of situations. And then as I got older, started realizing people were like, you know, you're kind of funny. And I, I really, I really wanted to probably go be an actor when I was about 10. I didn't know what it was, but I love John Ritter. God rest mm-hmm. his soul. I, mm-hmm. I used to watch Three's Company religiously. And um, my family came out to Huntington Beach. My father had a very good friend. And so when I was in, 1980 came out to Huntington Beach and spent two weeks there, and it was like being in paradise. I had never experienced anything like it, and I begged my mom not to take me home, and she did. And I had to finish <laughs> school, but I started getting the bug around then. It's very seductive, right? The, the, I mean, you said Hollywood felt like Mars to you, right? I feel like everybody who's even made it out here or made a career out here, it was Mars at some point. We're, you know, we're all from God, you know, wherever little town and it all seems so attainable. But you, you you weren't into comedy, you weren't into theater, but you had a desire to act. What made you come out here and become a comedian? Um, It's a lot. I'll try to keep it a simpler story. So basically, I had started getting that bug of of whatever it was. I didn't even know what acting was like. You're talking to somebody who's dumb. Like when I watch TV, I was like. I looked at Three's Company as a documentary. I didn't even like, I was like, this is so, <laughs> this guy has the best life. You know, I didn't realize anything that was happening. Like it was like, I didn't know what that was. I love chips. I love happy days. So. Wait, you uh, guys, quick, quick, quickly to cut in. Similarly, Jamie, I always thought that the people, you know, there were always so many great theme songs for all of those shows in the 80s. Like I, I can think of every single one of Come the ones you just named. Do. Yes. And I really thought that the, Actors in the show sang all the theme songs too. When I was <laughs> little, <laughs> I was like, "That sounds like that sounds exactly like Jack. That sounds like John Ritter. I, I, hey, all I, of it." <laughs> and I think I know later some of them did, like like Lee Majors did later. But I always thought they all just act in the show. They get to sing the song. What a life! 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought they lived in the places that they <laughs> shot the show. So, I mean, I'm with you. So, um, long stories. I I just started getting this uh, bug, and then I had I really had a couple of like little angels, you know, like, and you you hear that, but you don't realize until later. And so, I was always a kid that was kind of disruptive in class, not bad, but you know, like Catholic school disruptive, talking too much and that stuff, and. Um, Basically, what happened was I had a teacher. He told me about comedy when I was about a sophomore, and he was a what most comedians are is a substitute teacher, and he would come in a couple times a week, and he because he was trying to be a comedian, and he told me how he would do comedy in a club in downtown. I was like, "What is that?" And then um, a movie called Clean and Sober came to town. I didn't even know what that was. Oh, uh, Michael was, Keaton. Was, That's a great yeah. movie. And that shot at a neighboring parish. And we were like, they're shooting a movie there. And I'm like, no way. It was like the most insane thing. And my friend tried to be an extra. He explained what that was. And then he couldn't get it. And then, so I would started getting excited about it. Then there was like like little things on TV. And I started going, oh, I got to like, I, anytime there was like a TV open call, I would hear about it on the news and I would try to go down. And then the long story is at the end of high school, my friend's mom knew I was an actress. This is another little angel. And she said, I got a, a featured extra in, in this movie coming to downtown. I have three days. And um, if you come down with me, I bet I can get you on. And so I went down and I met the PA of the first CD. And they said, well, you cut your hair. I didn't know any of this. I was working at Domino's Pizza. And they said, you have this type of vest and these type of shoes. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you're hired. And then, boom, I was on a set. And then that movie was Dead Poet Society. Oh, and wow. What a great that first was my one. Oh. First foray into anything. It was a local extra in Dead Poet Society because my friend's mom was like a local actress who did like, like what Christine does, like theater and stuff. And literally, I was like at the craft service table and I saw Robin Williams like eating a baby carrot. And I was like, what? This is bizarre. Like, and then once I literally <laughs> stepped on that set, something happened. And I was like, oh, OK, this it was like my calling. I was like, OK, yeah. this is what I'm supposed to do. So then after that, I just graduated high school, so worked on a bunch of jobs for about eight, ten months, saved up a couple thousand dollars and came to L.A. And I'm like, I'm going to be an extra. <laughs> that was your dream yes <laughs> i had no idea about anything i because i thought if i could make money being an extra being on sets like this is cool i'll just try this and you know and and that's kind of how i started it's a long trial and error i had no idea no plans no idea what anything was but you went you 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 pivoted to stand-up comedy quickly no i came out tried it for a year um david you're what you're younger than me right I'm in I'm early 51. 50. Okay, you're a little younger than me. Um, and so I tell people this. I came out here in the late 80s, okay? I didn't even know what a headshot was. And remember, you'd always <laughs> do that first round of headshots with some creepy photographer and be like, hey, man. And yeah. they would charge you like 200 bucks. You'd save up the money to get the creepy photographer. And then you had to make that Z card and all the different looks. And then you have to <laughs> buy the envelopes all send them out. So I had to learn all this stuff about what an agent was and all this. So it took me about a year and change to l learn about living away from my house and just life stuff and learning how to literally what this, I used to buy drama log. People don't even know what that is anymore. And, uh, my, I basically had a, many jobs out here, but one of the early jobs I had is I would used to deliver coffee to prospect park so that was where they shot general hospital and when i learned what a casting director was every day i would put my headshot under mark tashner's door mark tashner i believe is the head casting director of general hospital to be an extra and he was one day he came out and he's like he's like kid every day you put your headshot under my door and every day i'm not gonna look at it and i was what, like what a really <laughs> Listen, he found, he just wanted his coffee. I was the studio coffee guy. And I was like, I, I don't fault him. How many people do that, right? And uh, <laughs> But I was on a set. Like, I got to see the behind the scenes delivering coffee, and it was incredible. And I knew that it was next to people that were on TV. And uh, 
one of my guys there was like, you're just so crazy. You should try stand up comedy. And that's how I kind of started. I did an open mic and then that was began my road, but I was always trying to act and do both. I, comedy I liked because I could go in, try something, get right. actual feedback as opposed to just waiting to see if an agent opened up my submission letter. Right. Well, it yeah. sounds like you, the, 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 the experiences of the, being the extra on the set and be, just seeing it and just sort of like that, like, this is cool. This is where I want to be. And you're just having the guts to just slide the head. Like a lot of people would not have done it. And I feel like you had to have had some kind of like, you just obviously were funny naturally like it sounds to me like you had a sense of humor about it like i'm gonna screw it i'm gonna put the headshot under his door every day until i get some kind you know That's like most a, people like might do it self, once self-starter you know yeah but i mean i think like there's something about like you're sort of like all right well uh, what have i got to lose you know and because to me stand up like, the, the, I mean, I, I, I've been in a lot of comedies. I th feel like I love comedy. I know it. I, I can perform it. But stand up to me, <laughs> nothing scarier, nothing more vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, it's you and your jokes and you alone. And like, to me, it's the bravest form of, of entertainment yeah, in our I business. I, I really believe it. I mean... I see that, but I'm do doing it for so long that it, I don't think like that. But right. I, I do agree that it is like you live and die by that sword. So when it works, it's beautiful. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. But a couple of things is, A, I had nothing going on, right? And so people are like, well, didn't you want to quit? And I'm like, yeah, I often <laughs> tried to quit. Like, but I didn't know. I didn't have anything else. Like I was already at the bottom. I was already, you know, barely delivering pizzas and, you know, working as a caterer and not making any money. And so I was like, I'm already there. So why as well just do this. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say comedians or trying to be a comic or being a comic. It's different when you're funny in a movie or different when you're funny in a TV show, but it's so you have the comic sensibilities, but obviously stand up is a different art form, but being a comedian, you have to have the, equal a part uh complete uh narcissism right that you believe mm -hmm. that hey i am so important that people are going to listen to me and equal parts insecurity that you need them to listen to you right. so it's a right. good mix of del and, del and, a and a healthy pinch of delusion and <laughs> if you do that <laughs> just enough to get through that's how you keep going but christine you know you said how scary stand-up is how scary is it sitting by the phone right? with no control over anyone maybe letting you do your work? So like it's you pick your pick your poison, right? Like right. I'm, I'm, I'm either going to take control back of, of my career and get up on stage and, and, and do something for myself or I'm going to sit by the phone and probably go insane. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. It's and so you true, just, David. You said something that's so true. And also today, people don't even know what that means. Like no. to pick up the phone. Like how about <laughs> like that? That's like how about to get your Skytel pager because you got beeped to run to the pay phone. Because my beeper kept beeping to call your commercial agent back because you might have a call back. Like, right, running to the pay phone, running to the pay phone. I want to say a name to you. Tell me what this means to you. Marty Powers. <laughs> That's all around that era. Wow. You guys Can you tell research. Tell, I us, it, tell no, us. I want you, Yeah, you please tell us. Talk about being a self-starter and just going for it. Who was Marty Powers? <laughs> so from nine, from like I said, from like moved out here in 89-ish. And it was from there learning about what, to live on your own and all this stuff. So then from 1990 is when I kind of da started comedy and dabbled in it. And then I got serious about it in 1991. So 91 to 95 was super, super broke struggle, struggle years. And um, that was every day felt like a week, you know? Um, and I basically, I had multiple, multiple jobs. You know, you get a job for two weeks, you get fired, all this stuff. 
Oh, I was telemarketing right by on La Brea, right by the Seventh Veil. You you probably <laughs> what, don't remember the strip what that club? is. I remember no. the I remember the Seventh <laughs> Veil. No, I don't know. I've never I've never heard of the Seventh. <laughs> uh, it was right by the it was Seventh Veil, um, right underneath Sunset. And there was a telemarketing office there. So I would go in the morning at 6 a.m. My buddy hooked me up with a job. And we would call and we were selling toner, which people don't know what that is, for coffee machines, which is a very uh, expensive commodity. That and every like lead the we office. got. <laughs> yes, it was like that. So every lead we got was 75 cents. So if you got 100 leads in a day, that's 75 bucks. So. $75 a day is pretty good now. I mean, so in the early 90s, it was amazing. So mm -hmm. I did that from like six to one. And then from like one to four, I don't even know if you remember this, but there used to be a, a lot of people that would pull sandwich carts and sell sandwiches to like agencies and stuff. Do you remember sandwich people going to the office buildings? <laughs> no. Anyway. Oh, I was one of those people. So I would deliver these sandwiches. You would oh, get... yes. They would wheel through the, the hallways. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So I did that. And every time you sold a sandwich, you got a commission. So I had an older guy and he was up by like Dohenian Sunset. And at the time I was learning about agencies. There was a company called Triad and it was owned by Marty Bauer. Oh, Marty yeah. Bauer eventually formed a company called UTA. And the, the guy that was on my route, that was this older, hilarious dude. I can't really do the voice. I'm half I'm like, I'm trying, but he would, I had to do it. The microphone sounds bad, but he would talk like this. And he would say, hey, kid, what do you got? You got roast beef. You got some provolone. What do you got? And so. That's what agents story, sound like, by the way. Yeah. Long story boring is I got good at selling t toner. I got good at selling sandwiches. I started doing my stand-up. I was doing characters. So I create, I basically read a book about the greatest salesman in the world. And it was, basically when you sell toner or product, you have to talk about the, the, the positive aspects of the product. So I looked at myself as a product and bam, I created this false persona called Marty Power because it sounded like Bauer. So people would mistake <laughs> him. And it was also powerful. So I wanted to manifest Power. That's a great and fake oh, agent genius. name. It's and genius. so I called. The, yeah, so I started calling everybody. And long story boring, I I got a ton of meetings out of it and pretended it was him. And then I would drop off the tape as myself, but in the lobby of the place. And then that's how I started. I literally would take stand up performances and He's put so them, incredible. and then they would rate it and tell me if it was good. And then if somebody liked it, he gave it to an agent. It's literally how I started by lies because no one wants you. Right. And and when did you crack that mystery wide open to the like, when did the public finally or were you just found out? Here's what's crazy. Oh, dude, how I got found out. I want to say this is a real agency book. Yeah, I'm like I'm post 50 brain is. I called CAA and got through. I called um, as as I, Marty as Marty Powell. Yes, I started having <laughs> relationships with assistants because I was charming on the telephone, right? And I called, I called many the big places. I got through, and they would say, "Yes, yeah, send your tape or whatever." Here's what it is, and then sometimes people would watch it and then sometimes they would actually call me back. But the people that busted me, I don't know if you remember this name. I'm pretty sure it's a real name. It was Jack Scagnetti. Do you remember a guy named Jack Scagnetti? It sounds he was familiar. A, it sounds real. He, I, it definitely sounds familiar. Yes. He was a deep 818 no, North Hollywood agent. Okay. <laughs> and he was like, I called and I'm like, hey, listen to me. And he goes, who's this? And I go, no, listen, I go, he goes, this is bullshit. So he, <laughs> the, the guy who busted me was a, another low time hustling agent. <laughs> so I realized <laughs> you can't go to them because. Don't hustle a hustler, right? Yeah, they know. <laughs> right. And um, I almost got this show out of it. I auditioned 10 times, like not 10 times, but like five times. It was called the computer wore tennis shoes. I went in so many times This was before how high. And um, with Kirk Cameron, I didn't get that. And I was, but, but like, 
that was enough to like them saying, okay, you call him back. So they would call, leave a message for Marty on his voicemail. And then the, it, he would relay the message to me. And that's how I started. But Dude, I got a so... meeting out of, I know it was crazy. It's such a detailed story, but mm-hmm. and I got my first little holding deal for six months out of that, out of completely making it up. Wow. But just, just to recap, uh, Jamie Kennedy moves to LA and creates a false persona to be his own agent named Marty Power. And this almost seems like a bit out of like the Jamie Kennedy experiment. Like it's it's no wonder that you went on to do comedy and characters and sketch. I mean, you literally created your career by c- creating a, a comedy character of like some old New York agent to get yourself your first jobs. It's genius. It was, it's insane. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, it was, I mean, it was, so it was cool. crazy. I was so desperate. I didn't know what to do. I was living in my buddy's, like, a little room above his garage that I had known from the stand-up circuit. And what's crazy is, is I started thinking about it. I Then I met my girlfriend, and my girlfriend got me a spot at the comedy store. Ron Levitt, I think Jessica was there. She saw me, brought me in, and I met Ron. And this was like, I tell people how it was like Ron basically gave me the job in the room. You know how mm. he is. Like he's yeah. the sweetest guy. And it was like, he's already cast all the leads in you guys. And then he was like, he was like, yeah, I like you. You know, you can try it. He had a little <laughs> Marty power in him. He smoked. <laughs> oh and yeah. He's a character. He's Wait, the, so, the so did Marty, Marty and, power and negotiate your deal for, for <laughs> dad, or did you just, <laughs> I was too scared. So I he was wasn't already, a good negotiator. <laughs> I basically just took whatever they gave. This was like Fox. Of now course. the MTV thing, I had my friend who I was staying with, who wore, who was going to school in his graduate program for UCLA law. So he did that deal right. as we were doing it. It was like another young kid, which was crazy. But that piece of tape, this is what I'm going back to, is that David, that piece of tape from How High, like, got me into so many doors. Tape. Remember, I had to have tape. Physical tape. A physical VHS tape. Yes. So they could see, ooh, and, like, you know, so it was like, you fake it till you make it. And, yeah, I mean. so true. It's so true. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine. How did you pitch yourself? (laughs) <laughs> like, how did Marty pitch you? Well, I got this kid, Jamie Kennedy. You will not believe. <laughs> I got it. Well, here's what it is. So you have to do something. You have to compare. So you have, right. like, if you're, how can I say this? I'm making my brain work. So, like, back in a copy machine days, we would say, like, I got a, I try to do the voice, but he was like this. But I would say, I got a Rico 315, which was, like, remember, I was a Rico and a Canon Six nine seven. So you would say this this machine is between a Rico three one five and a Canon three nine seven, whatever. So you compare <laughs> things, and then people go, oh, and you do something called getting them on the hook. <laughs> so for me, I said this was my line. I said I got a kid here who's a cross between Robbie Benson and James Woods, with a little <laughs> bit of Jerry Lewis sprinkled in. Now those were the names that you would throw in, like. The zany, oh my god! Like, Your voice Robbie dropped Benson. like three octaves too, and so then they would bring me in. But Robbie Benson was like the go-to man. You know what I mean? Oh so my like, gosh! I mean, we, the eighties. I mean, he was, was in everything. Iconic. We just we just watched one on one recently. Um, <laughs> yes, he Robbie Benson was everything back then. So, but, but you you but crossed to, but Robbie Benson with Ro- James, James Woods. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> imagine. And then I wanted to have a little sprinkle edge. in some Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis. <laughs> It's amazing. Oh, it's genius. You talk about like your first movie was Dead Poet Society, even as an extra. I was an extra. And then before the screen days, I I, I mean, the movies that you did – uh, Bowfinger and Three Kings and Scream. I, it, se- it seems like you only did j- enormous, incredible movies. Yeah, I was so fortunate. Like, um, I started getting commercial agent out of that. And I went on a ton of commercials. And then once I got this Rally Hamburger regional commercial. <laughs> oh, Rally Burger, yeah. Not national. Rally- Not national. Yeah, it was a regional. <laughs> regional. And... um. 
that was an amazing piece of tape. And then that led to an El Pollo Loco regional and then a Vans national. So you guys know the terms. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting all of these things. And then basically once along with your guest spot and then Ron brought me back kind of a similar character for unhappily ever after. Right. And I did that. I did about three or four episodes of that, which was incredible. Same casting director, Tammy Billick. God bless you, Tammy. Oh, yeah. Brought me in for Ellen. And mm. Ellen, this is when Ellen had a show. I did that show, was, too. I did that show, too. This is this with Jeremy this, this Piven. When she was straight. And, uh, yes, exactly. So, she had to come out. She was straight. Yep. yep. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> like. It was she like had boyfriends were, on the show. She had boyfriends yeah, she had on boyfriends the show. Yep. On the show. Yeah. So, Wait, so. and time out. My episode was directed by Robbie Benson. Oh my God! How do you bring that back oh, around? I can't I believe it. Bam! That's good stuff. <laughs> I want Wow, because he did do that. I want yeah. I want I did one with him. I don't know, but yeah. oh my God, that's right. He did direct that. Yeah. So it was. It was. It was Alan. It was Joe. Uh, Jolie. Uh, yep, Joel, Fisher, yep, exactly. And it, D- Dave Higgins. Um, Dave Higgins. Yeah, and it was Jeremy Piven, Jeremy. and I was again like the wacky neighbor. And Ellen was just so sweet, so kind. Everybody was. They encouraged me. Ellen was the first big star to ever go. I tell people this all the time. It's like I was doing something funny in this in rehearsals, and she and I just went for it because I was like, you know, and and Ellen's like, yeah, do you see him? Give him more time. He's funny. Oh so my she, gosh. That's she awesome. knew funny. She That's knew awesome. funny. Yeah. She, yes, and she always said. By making everyone funny, this show would be funnier. Yeah. Because she's so confident and so skilled at what she and does. And she's right. She's absolutely right. Yes. And so what that whole point was to say is that obviously she's a super successful but a very secure person. And so it, it, thinking about this is that these TV spots and these commercials, Ron Levitt really was the beginning of like be yourself. He, I was just lucky because I met these beautiful souls in the beginning of my career. And they were like, gave me the freedom to have fun. Alan gave me the freedom to have fun. So then when I auditioned for a movie, which was Romeo and Juliet, and after multiple auditions, Baz was just like, I want you to be you. And I was like, sure. And so then on the set, I mean, I got that. It was, you know, a wild process to get that movie. It would be five podcasts. But I got that role. And then on the set, he made you feel like you could do no wrong. And then going into Scream, the same with Wes. He was like, have fun. So I was very blessed to get with people that were auteurs Mm -hmm. and complete freedom and artist lovers. They love young talent. And I tell people that like TV is just so hard the way it was, I don't know how it is now ish. Um, it's a little bit more free if you get on a streamer with a big person running the show. But when it says TV by committee, it's completely suffocating compared to what it is when you're working with a, an auteur. But what, but what validation for you after all of the, you know, self-starting that you had to do, you have Ron Levitt, Boz Lerman, Wes Craven, all telling you, we appreciate you for you. Mm. Do your thing, man. I mean, what? You, that's just, I mean, and those are the, the, some of the greatest talents to, to ever direct. Yeah. I mean, I just with them and David O. Russell and Frank Oz and Tony Scott. And then <laughs> being at the time with the, with the, uh, like everyone was coming up, you know, Leo and Will uh, Smith and, you know, Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney and Cube. And so, all of these things. Yeah, I, I was fortunate. And once I got on that run, as we do, you just go and you start feeling really confident. You start going with yourself. Because I would watch you. And actually, you don't know how much you you mentored me because I watched Kevin and I watched you. And you were the lead of the show. Denise was your love interest and Kevin was your best friend. So you could say you're all the three leads, but it was based around your character. And you guys have been acting for a while. 
And so I watched and, and like you, you guys had such a confidence on that set because probably you had done a lot up until that point. I mean, so I was, yeah, you start getting there and then it's just, you know, you get very comfortable and then you start going to these events and you start going to premieres and then you're like, okay, I'm in this ecosystem. Yeah, you that um, you know, it's funny that you you're suddenly well, that's what I was gonna ask you about. When you first got those breaks, did you ever have that and it sounds to me, and you called them the little angels. It was those people that meant so much to you that did encourage you. But I, I mean, to me, anytime I would go on a new set, and you said it really well, we've said this a lot, especially being guest stars on TV shows where you're so the outsider. The and it's, it is the hardest thing to come into. And I felt the exact same way with Ellen DeGeneres, who was just immediately every single guest star on that show felt like we were as important as the as the leads on the show. But did you ever feel especially because of how you got there, that sort of imposter syndrome for a bit. Like, okay, I'm here now. Now I really oh, have to show up because I, I still have it. I still have it. I still do too. <laughs> I still do. Um, I mean, I feel like the TV, like you just said, is so much like that. But again, I was so lucky because I did, you know, even David's pilot, like, you know, I think it was probably early some of us first jobs or second jobs. I think David had more experience. I'm not sure. I'm sure you did. And I, I know Kevin was acting as a child, but like I think it was one of Denise's early jobs. And so yeah. I feel that when I definitely felt it on that show, like I felt super scared syndrome. Like I tell people this all the time. Like I know I was raised to like know your lines be ready to go at any time. You're a backup quarterback. And the minute they call you, you better hit it on their first take. And like to the point yeah. where Ron really thought I was stoned all the time because I was like kind of not always in character. Dude, I thought you of- were stoned all the time. <laughs> he's, he's in, Jamie's in the back of every scene <laughs> shuffling through and they'd give him a one-liner like a, like a Spicoli line. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and definitely that imposter syndrome because I don't want to be fired. And so I don't want to mess up. So mm-hmm. you definitely feel like that. And TV is because they have their thing and then you come in. And But like, like I said, like you guys and Alan, it was so welcoming. I was very fortunate. I didn't have any toxic environments. And then when you do a movie, you're kind of all hired together sure. at the same time. So even though you're not the star, but if you're seventh or eighth on the call sheet. But you, you're you an ensemble. Like, okay. yeah. yeah. Yes. But, um, com- but I told people this like all the time, like when I did Scream, like one of the first scenes was in the video store and I got there and I worked out and I went to like Denny's with Rose. And then like, I knew I had to shoot in like two days and I just ate. And I'm like, I don't think I can go to Denny's anymore because like, I got to like make sure I know these lines. Like what happens if I don't know my lines? Like, <laughs> wait, so wait, wait, I, wait. How, how is Denny's <laughs> preventing you from learning lines? I mean, God, I'm just like, I thought I would join myself, but I was like, All I right. wasn't saying my lines. I was just eating my, you know, moon is over my hammy. And I'm like, so like I lock myself in my room. <laughs> it's over my head. <laughs> it's true. Did this whole scene in a whole day, and like we did it in a half a day. When I had the afternoon off, I'm like, we're done. He's like, we're done. I'm like, you got. It. He's like, we got. It. I'm like, of course you never know if you got it. I, you know, finally realized I got it maybe 20 years after that movie came out. Right. Mm. So then uh, I didn't have a scene for three days. And, you know, I did not check out the city. I didn't go. I did one thing. I think I remember I went to the mall with Courtney and I was like, and I was like, whatever you need. Like I was helping her with stuff and whatever. And she was, you know, obviously <laughs> this global icon. And I was mm-hmm. like, just so happy to be next to her. And then we had a coffee. And then after that, I hid in my room. And cause I had like another, like, whole like three quarters of a page of dialogue i was gonna say you were the one who was such the i mean and you did it so beautifully and that was the film that for the horror movie buffs like me who grew up watching all of them and you were the you sort of gave the comedic exposition like the the, those monologues that you have about jamie lee curtis and like right i'll be right it was so brilliantly written and it's just the the film is iconic but it just it also was because i think for for true horror movie fans it was sort of like oh this better not be making fun of horror movies 
but it it was scary. It was good. It was twisty. It was it was just and you really. I mean, everyone in it is 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 great in the franchise, but you just would all come in and nail those scenes. You were so funny and so good. And of course, like all along, as like the red herring is is it you? Is it you know? It just is. It was so well done, and I just feel like you're. It, it, it just, and I think it's what you said. It was wor- the difference of working with an auteur and coming in and feeling safe to do your thing. It, mm-hmm. it was you. I don't think probably anyone else who came in and read for that part read it the way you read it. I'm going to guess. <laughs> well, I, and like, I thank you. You're so kind and so sweet. And it was, it was lightning in a bottle. And, and, you know, to get the auteur of West, to get the genius, uh, of, of Kevin, you know, to get this lightning in a bottle cast of everybody that was emerging. I would like, again, I, that was the one where I had really, I was the least amount of credited person on that one. So it was incredible to be part of, but like to just answer that first part is just like, yeah, I was so scared. So the imposter syndrome on that was real because I was like, I don't want to mess this up. And then to be able to, to get the role because I had gotten the role and the usual suspects were around that, that they wanted because they had more credits. So like, you know, Bracken, I thought he was mm-hmm. going to get it. Jason <laughs> Lee, mm-hmm. I thought he was going to oh, get boy, it. Yeah. Seth Green, I'm mm-hmm. like, he's going to get it. And that was like, <laughs> but if it wasn't for Wes, you know, I wouldn't have got it. He, I mean, all those guys are amazing as we know, but I just, Wes was like, there's something about this guy for this role I like. And this. Mm-hmm. The rest is history. And was that was that Lisa Beach who cast that too? Yes. The, and the oh, reason I say I that is her. coming full circle back to those casting directors who believed in you. She cast me in my first movie and I had a, the teeniest, tiniest part. I had no credits, but she just kept bringing me in and, and I read for a bigger role and I ended up getting a, a smaller mo- role in it. But it was she was always loved me. And I remember she would stand outside with me and she's like, they're going to love you. And you're, she was just so much of a champion and i just and i because of course i i auditioned <laughs> as everybody in the world auditioned for west for i mean i i i think I, I i made it to some sort of final round of something ironically it was when i was shooting my see my episode with ellen degeneres <laughs> <laughs> on that show too. Wait, and it was you for the, all for the Drew circle. Barrymore, uh, the opening scene. Or did you read for? No, Sydney? it was for it was for Sydney and for it was for the Rose part oh. and the Nev part. It was like they had me read both, and I wanted it so. Like it, there are movies out there because of being such a horror movie fan. I was like, there's nothing I want more than this movie. And of course, it was not meant to be, but I love those stories when it's like you said, all the usual suspects. You know? Yes. <laughs> I mean, Lisa is exactly that. She's, she's again, another angel. Like, I, yeah. I'm really lucky. Yeah. Like, I always tell people, uh, I, I've never, have, I've, I've never seen, you hear about things in Hollywood and different things. I've only, I've never seen anything horrible. I've been very fortunate. I've seen, I've been around, I've never really been that on too many, any sets that are terribly toxic. There've been creative differences, but it's never been toxically awful. And I've always been around people that pretty much, you know, encourage yeah. or like to give you the freedom to play. And so it's usually when you get to the lower, no disrespect, but some of the lower budget ones that people take it so damn seriously. And you're like, dude, I just did, you know, just work with Tony Scott, chill out. You know and it's like? <laughs> and it's I know what I'm I think, doing. Yeah. I think it's because we get in these working with secure people and who know what they were doing. And it was more hands off. I mean, we went in for Lisa Beach, like you said, she encouraged you. She had the director's ear. She would say, this person's really good. I really like them. And the director wants to find somebody and then you do good. And she's like, you, you make, they make us look good. We make them look good. It's right. a love community. Right. I mean, but Casting I Casting directors who love actors are such a gift. And most yeah. of them I find do. They love actors and they want you to crush it. You know, mm-hmm. I, owe, I owe so many of them to breaks, like literally like those are my breaks in those rooms. And like I tell people now, they're like, you know, self tape Kings or zoom meetings. I'm like, that's unfortunate because getting in that room and that place and that time with these people is, a, is half the battle. You know what I'm saying? Like when I got scream, 
I wasn't even off book. Do you remember you never had to be off book? Like, right. You, you could yeah. hold the pages. You held, you held the pages, it, could, yeah. it, it felt real. It felt work workshoppy. It felt like there was a synergy and an energy in the room that it either was or it wasn't. And you knew the rooms when you went in and it wasn't. You knew yes. it. You could feel it. So you didn't really get your hopes up. You'd walk out and say that, Mm-mm, not happening. Yeah. I tell people this. Well, I want to, uh, I did a job a couple of years ago and you'll probably relate to this is I went in, it was a TNT show. It was like nine, nine seasons deep. It's a great show. And it was like a three episode arc. And it was like a co-head director and they found a dead actress and it was like comedic, but dark, you know, like a dramedy. I go in, there's 12 people looking at me and they're like, you skipped, you skipped uh, half of the line. And I had to do it all over again. They're like, it was and instead of and. Like, literally, technically. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. And then I was like, and I did really good. And they were just like, you know, we love Jamie. We're going to go a different way. And then, like, Roger Missunden, who's an amazing cast director, he, there was, like, an episode of Lucifer. Lucifer and he's like, here, Jamie. And he, like, did two episodes. He just gave me two episodes. Because it's like, they know what I can do. And I'm not saying the other people didn't, but there's such an overthinking now that turns me off in our business. It's like, it's too, it's wild. Yeah. We, yeah. we saw, we've talked to uh, actors it, it, uh, in this time right now where everything's self tape and those relationships that we were able to form with the Lisa beaches, uh, it doesn't happen. Young actors can't form those relationships. It's all just self tape, email it in and, and that's it. They don't know you. You know, they don't like like the people you said that, you know, Roger and they they champion you because they knew you. It was incredible. It's we I know. Think about it. It was just a different time. I think our business has changed wildly. It's fascinating. And like the barrier to entry, like I don't love gatekeeping, but I love the fact that we were, we were blessed by this line of artistic defense. But mm-hmm. now. I mean, the good news is there's easier ways to break in in terms of like social media and stuff. But the bad news is everybody is. Uh, everybody they're... is. <laughs> That's the bad news. Everybody <laughs> thinks they can do it, right? Swimming through, like. <laughs> oh. Jamie, uh, how did Scream change your career? Because you talk about the usual suspects. Scream comes out, and you, you know, one of the one of the the lead characters. Did it? Did it? it lead to offers and easier opportunities. I know want to get into your show, but did it change everything? Completely changed everything. Um, it, it wasn't so much offers as it was like, it was just getting into rooms like high Access. end rooms. Right. It, yeah. When you're in a, when you're in a movie, that's one thing when you're in a, a, a hit movie, that's another thing. And when it keeps just like, Oh, he was, just, he's in screen and it's out in the theaters. Like it was out at the time. So you're literally taking those meetings as it's out. Um, yeah. I mean, I got to meet a lot of people and the decisions were much easier. Like it was more like I got like one meeting with the director and then in the room, it was more like a work session thing. I started getting those and then pretty much, you know, get the job or not get the job in the room. And then like in these, because indies were popping off, it was easier. That's when I started getting like a little leads in, mm-hmm. in smaller indies and like, you know, practicing my, you know, darker acting skills or not, whatever. <laughs> they let me be a little bit more dramatic. And so it was incredible. It was just a But the Jamie wonderful- Kennedy experiment, sorry to interrupt, the Jamie Kennedy experiment, somebody obviously came to you and said, you come up with your own show. This, this was your brainchild, yeah, right? I had that after like doing a bunch of movies and stuff, then I got, um, you know, I was with my agencies and the agencies want to put me on TV. And I was like, but I'm loving the movies. And, you know, we don't know their motive. Obviously we know now it's like, they want you to, they want to make that big ass syndication fee, which is great and packaging right. fee. But when you're doing all these movies, you kind of want to keep moving. In. Um, and so <laughs> Keep I, moving. Keep moving. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> Different well, times. Dude, yeah. yeah. You're Once you're in the movies, you never go kids. back. But yeah. now people can star in movies and then do six episodes on Hulu. So everything is... Right, there's no difference. Know, the Jamie Kenny experiment was after. I had about a good, you know, I was busy for like four and a half, five years just from movie to movie to movie to movie. And then um, started getting... I was always like the 
funny friend or whatever. And then I got a holding deal. And then I was always doing stand up as I was doing the movies. It's not as much, but I had enough where I was doing a lot of doing colleges. And sometimes I would do it all turn, uh, occasional club weekend. And I had characters. And so that's kind of how it started of like, well, what kind of show would you be? And so, and they were just like, what do you got? And then I met with the guys from Mad TV. And again, like because of that fun play, I, it was the pressure was less. It was it was a lot of stuff to get the show going, but I didn't feel like I could fail. I feel like I could try anything. And they would say, nah, I don't like that. Yeah, I like that. Mm, try this. And so that's how it really started. But once, you know, we started making it, Jordan is a friend of, like, again, like we said, we love actors, like, good casting directors do and he would just be like this is so crazy he's like this is, it makes me laugh i'm gonna put it on i hope it works <laughs> it was a perfect vehicle for you and i like in my mind i the show was on for years and years and i it, i guess it was only a few years but i it like, did feel, three yeah but it was it was so well done thank you buddy this was so much fun i gotta come in more prepared with my life to remember my life you guys really get in there <laughs> Are you kidding? Dude, you gave us some amazing stories and took us on a journey. And thank you so much for, for joining us. It's so Such good to see you. Such a pleasure. Really good to see you. You're just awesome. Thank you for having me. You guys are awesome. I appreciate it. We love the good vibes and hopefully we'll see each other off pod. Yes, off pod. Let's. <laughs> I would love to. I'll, I'll find where you're doing stand up and I will be, I'll just sneak into the audience. Come. You can be my guest. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Thanks Jamie. Buddy. Love you. Okay. Bye. Bye. What a sweet dude, man. Really. That is the greatest story, the greatest show business story of breaking of in. Start be, be, Mar- pretending Marty to be his Tower. own agent. That is talk. brilliant and ballsy and funny and um so well deserved because he really is just um he's just been great in everything. That, uh, all, so many of the films he mentioned. We've rewatched recently during the pandemic, and he's just terrific in all of them. Um, yeah, another great one episode. Of the, one of the best self-starting stories yeah. I've heard. Somebody like he literally Same, did, who's, it took who's him a our year generation, to who's our right. who who's in our age range, all of it, and to see what it took for him to break through. We all have sort of fluke stories about it, but to to work his butt off. And how about the job to job to job from sandwich carts to telemarketing to um, all while he's figuring out who do you know i'm getting ripped off by the headshot lady and, and right. like I, I can't get an agent so i'll pretend to be my own agent i yeah. mean it's just that whatever it sounds like he looks back on those days as as fond memories and just you know those hustling days are they're good times you oh know? the best the best and he's such a great attitude about it all really fun interview flew by yes. um and uh all right we're gonna let everyone go we will see you next time yes thanks for listening everybody we'll see you uh next week thanks for listening make sure to subscribe and give us five stars and please follow us on instagram at hey dude the 90s called see you next time <laughs>